Carmel Winters, Manakan, Magan, pleasure to chat to both of you today. Gia Gwich, August Gia Smurgwich. What do I say for plural, Manakan? Dia Smurri Galeir, I suppose. Dia Smurri Dweev Galeir. All right, nice one. We're going to talk all things Osquale. We're not all things Osquale, but we're going to talk. Uh, Carmel Winters, thank you for joining me too. You're our core connection to this one. Great. And uh, just so you know, I won't be speaking Osquale for the whole show. <laughs> no, no, I would love if I was able to. I've a compli- Like many Irish people, I have a complicated history with the, a story with the language and one that I uh, now regret and will someday fix or will one day fix, will soon fix uh, and might have through Skull Scarship, which we'll get to. Um, but just to just to set this up a, a little bit, Carmel, you're a filmmaker from Mallow. Uh, most recently, your film, well, relatively recently, at least, uh, Float Like a Butterfly, a story of a young traveller girl who wanted to be a boxer, opened the Cork Film Festival and you uh, enlightened and enlivened that whole opening ceremony with your fantastic flowing verbose speech on the night. It was a wonderful film and it was, ah, listen, once you get going now, it's, it's, you just sit back and uh, sit back and enjoy it. So I'm looking forward to this chat today. And Manakon, you are, well, uh, I suppose a travel writer, uh, but uh, an Irish language advocate, uh, someone who I'm uh, signed up, signed up to the fan book, fan club, I should say. I'm waiting for my stamp and my, my badge. Uh, but 32 words for field is something that inspired you too, Carmel. We'll get to that in a moment. I've, I've followed on. I'm in the I'm in the tree dog thing too, mm-hmm. and um and so what you might maybe explain what thirty two f- words for field was you know what you were trying to do with this book and then we might go to you Carmel as to how it inspired you and what you then did with that. Mm, so over to you, Monacan. Yeah. So the book I you know I I've done different things for the Irish language for many years. I had a, in two thousand and seven I had a TV series called No Berna where I just tried to go around Ireland just speaking the Irish language. And it, it got quite a lot of attention, but at the same time, it was sort of a negative thing to do, to show up that people didn't understand the language. And at the same time, Des Bishop was coming out with his, in, know, in the name of the father, which was a really positive thing. Basically, you know, a New York educated man learning Irish in Connemara. But I realized there's so much to say about the Irish language. And yet in public discourse, we seem to say the same things the whole time. We say that I was badly taught or I was beaten into me or there's no point in it or the government wastes all these millions on it. And I thought maybe maybe all elements of that are all true. But at the same point, there is so much more to say about the language. And why does no one ever say it? So I thought this is my opportunity. There's like we have this ancient language that's connected to all these other really old languages. It's been spoken in this this island for like two or three thousand years. Why do we start talking about all these? And I decided I was going to put all those idea, ideas into a novel. And I spent about three years working on a novel with all these ideas. And eventually, Michael Keegan Dolan, a sort of a choreographer based in West Kerry, said to me, if you have something to say, why hide it in a, fic- in a work of fiction? If you have something you want to say about the Irish, just write a factual book. So then I spent another two years getting all the ideas, the notes I had from the fiction, and put it together as 32 words for fields, which is basically a book that tries to show the insights that the language gives into the landscape, into our culture, into our own inner psyche, and most especially into the other world. And had I published that book, I think any other year, it you know probably would have just sort of nudged along slowly. But the fact that I published it just in you know halfway to the beginning of COVID in September 2020, when everyone was looking for meaning and for deeper culture, it seemed to have caught people's attention. And it very much caught your attention, Carmel. Where where do you? Come into the story then from there. Yeah, Moncon, you very kindly sent me the book. No, you didn't. I did um ordered for my birthday. For my 50th birthday, it was my present from my partner Tama. And it was a wonderful present. It was exactly what was needed. It's just like what Moncon was say it was saying there about the search for meaning. I think lockdown brought about so many crises. And for me, it was my mother's dying in lockdown. Um, she died. Um, the last she spent the last four months of her life um, dying in isolation because of lockdown. Um, so there was a terrible time, but those terrible times are rich kind of terrain for spiritual uh, reverie or spiritual experience, reviewing everything through a very different lens. And to me, the book dovetailed with that completely. The book is just such a revelation of this realm as part of actually our heritage, my heritage, our heritage. And, you know, just to kind of 
lend that in more you know concrete terms to, to even learn from Moncon that as a gale as an Irish person the gale means tree person I never knew that imagine not knowing that about yourself when you describe yourself as a gale that you don't know you're really a tree person and uh, for me in a, the whole bereavement process and uh, my connection with nature was to great big healer and I felt that was just laced throughout 32 words for field was it was written by someone who's gone deep in nature and really um a great lover of the natural phenomena which is itself a spiritual experience like i mean there's nothing like contemplating nature for getting a whole feeling of the cycles of life and you know both how precious it is and really okay i'll be dead too <laughs> there look at that tree down Look what's growing in that dead tree. And I felt the Irish language that Moncon was selecting to put before us that he was curating in that book was very rich in, um, uh, it was a very kind of rich selection that Moncon put before us. And uh, it enchanted me and really snared my imagination. That's a good word. I like it and in, in, in enchanted you. Uh, and I like the connections too. You know, one thing I think that even you refer to in your book, Mon Con, is the idea of you, the ability to see uh, the world in, in a different way through the Irish language. Uh, and I think a thing that captured me in school time, if not the language itself, was the Brian Friel play translations. And just that idea of there being a hidden meaning behind so much of uh, what we live in. And that might be the moment that we're in now maybe there's um some healing to be done some some deep psychological traumas in the irish psyche that that this can be a part of of of, of a healing process and connecting us back to something that was once the way we saw the world through and there's no reason we couldn't return to being a bilingual country i don't think and many other countries in the world manage to be bilingual it's unusual perhaps perhaps there are other examples but most countries in the world tend not to lose their their native tongue entirely and, and we I, but it must have been a psychologically difficult time when all that went on, you know, arguably periods where uh, grandparents weren't able to communicate with their grandchildren and vice versa. I mean, and that, you know, um, that must have been difficult. And of course, a huge period of moments in time when the Irish language was lost to a degree was through the famine and post famine. So there's all sorts of things. And maybe we're coming to that right moment now. You know, Irish people are so proud to be Irish. And yet in most other countries in the world, the number one aspect of your national, your pride in your people is your is is the language and yet for us here we're proud of everything to do with our, to, to do with what it is to be irish we go oh yeah oh oh yeah no no but not the language it's it's such a strange sort of dichotomy or a weird thing that i i'd love us to get over i'm sorry i'm sorry just i just have one little thing i think a lot of irish people feel that because they're irish and feel so irish and so connected to here think they should be able to push a button and it just flows out and yeah. feel a sort of a, a dissonance with that, that they're it's, they're uncomfortable that it doesn't just come out of your pores. And because it doesn't, they actually sort of distance themselves from it as a way of protecting themselves from the uncomfort, the discomfort that they feel. Now, maybe I'm speaking about myself there, but I, I, I feel there's something wider in that as well. I, I think you hit the nail in the head because if there's no one around to vet our Irish, we'll happily let on to you know speak Irish to someone when they ask us to hear our language. I mean, I love it. I love speaking Irish to people abroad to let them hear what it sounds like. But I'm shy if there's someone who realizes, like Tom and my partner is Scots, and she says, Oh, she's flown to Irish. I go, I'm not. <laughs> and I'm so busy disclaiming that, which is actually yeah. patently untrue. Yes. But um that um that, that distracts from the real, there is a love of it actually underneath the embarrassment and not speaking it, I think. Absolutely. But I also take it as well where people go, oh, I can't speak Irish. And you go, right. Well, in comparison to someone from Japan. Oh, well, I mean, yes. I mean, I can I understand loads of words and I can say loads. Well, I mean, that that like so we I don't know what what's your take on that, those sorts of ideas? Monica? I love your idea about the we feel we should be able to press a button. And that's a natural feeling, you know, press a button and the language comes because that is what happens to Icelandic people or, you know, Japanese people or people in Africa. They just naturally they have five languages. And so why don't we? And again, you mentioned it was so clear. It was just a beautiful accident that the famine, as you said, 1840s, came a decade after the British government set up this national school system, 1831, the first national school system. So these Irish, you know, poor peasants, working people suddenly had access to an education. The only trick was the education was only through English. They could have turned their backs on that. 
But then in those 1840s, as you, say, as you said, the land suddenly failed them. The, the crops suddenly died. Now that had never happened, you know, you know, for a few hundred years. And it would always come back when there were bad years. But this year, year after year, the land failed. And so the people looked around themselves and they couldn't blame Britain. They couldn't blame anything. I mean, Britain was obviously at fault, but for them, it was just the potatoes were dying. And so they said, the only chance is if we teach our children English, then they can get not only to America or England, but they needed English to be in Kilkenny or to be in Cork or to be in Dublin. To be in a city in Ireland in the 1840s, you needed English. So it was this beautiful act of sacrifice that our parents did, you know, basically our ancestors' parents did of making sure they were never going to allow their children to hear this language. They were going to beat, we often say it was in the national school, school system that the words were beaten. It was the parents who this beautiful act of love said, you will not speak this language. And again, that could just, that's a story. But now the latest revelations in epigenetics reveal that that goes into the DNA. It goes into the outer layer of the DNA, the epigenetics, not the gene, but the epi around the DNA. And so you can now see that in the next generation, that mental st stress and trauma with, with regard to the language will be triggered every time you hear the language. And so that's why when we go into school, we, we pick up French and we pick up geography, we pick up Spanish, you sp speak a word, the epigenetic trigger, just like a holly tree, you know, holly tree doesn't have um, sharp points on its needles until a cow bites at it. And then the next holly tree suddenly has a spark. It is, so, we, so what is needed is for us to do that work to realize there is this trauma connected with language. And the minute you can do that work, you can release it. And then we can start. And that's why I believe this new, this new renaissance is happening. Because the beginning of that triggering happened when we were no longer poor. We were dirt poor up until the 1980s. We had to emigrate for a chance. Then that Celtic boom, that Celtic tiger, rewired re us to think actually we can have money. And that's when T.G. Carr came along and all them sort of modern movies um, made in Irish and, and the versions of Scooby-Doo and SpongeBob SquarePants in Irish. And that was a moment where we could rethink, I, I believe, Mm. And all the Guelph skulls as well, and the the and and how and actually even that's a sign how many like uh, people unable to speak a lot of us Guelph are very keen to send their kids to Guelph skulls. Like there is there's a there's a coming back, you know. So that act of love, as you spoke of it, and it's you know that sacrifice. I never looked at it that way, but maybe you know the return act of love is to is to bring it back at this at this later changed point in our history. Uh, you know, you you know you you mentioned about this, the schools and going to the cities, but there's also going to America. Uh, England or Australia, for which, you know, if that was to be your future, you also needed to be, uh, you know, able and capable to speak Osweirla. Um, so that was another aspect of it too. And right up until the 50s, I mean, I think National Geographic had a piece around then uh, about the dying Irish, uh, the population, you know, was plummeting. Like, so there, there was a lot of sort of uh, negativity around, let's say, maybe, maybe things that you'd call Gaelic. And um, on the tree people bit, I think I tweeted this up to one of your posts on something or other, because I read Niall McQueacher. Uh, is a great naturalist and he, he I, wrote, I read his book on, on Irish tree wisdom I think but he has a theory in it now I don't know whether it's just his own or anything else but it's all about the ohm language and he, he basically he reckons first of all he reckons the term ohm might have been given to that language by the Welsh and I think he called it a tree language uh, and and then thinks that perhaps uh, Gael comes from those who have the tree language which is also equally wonderful. I don't think it takes anything away from the tree people, Carmel, as you suggested, um, but that we were bringing, you know, a, an Irish alphabet uh, across the water and recognised for it. So, you know, we were the potentially the land of the saints and the scholars even then. Um, but you're right, there's a lot of connections I think all of us can make um, that would be, like uh, for me as well, as well as translations, that, that triggered something, not necessarily straight away, but over time where you drive around, you'd, you'd, first of all, I don't understand why we have English in big letters and Irish in small letters on the place. Like, why are they not an equal, equal, you know, and we have that psychologically. It's like, yeah, yeah, there's the English so you can understand it. And look underneath, look, that's, that's what it means in Irish, but we have it small. You don't really have to pay attention to it. But if we're a truly bilingual country, I think those ought to be in the same same size. Um, but what you realize is like, you know, Dublin means nothing. Dublin means something. It's set, and, you you know, you take that across Kirky, like Kirky Morn and Moon, the great marsh of Munster. And all of a sudden you realize that the city of Cork probably destroyed an ecological wonderland when it was founded on those islands in the two channels, you know. Um, but it tells you something. And there's, there is hidden meaning that through the language, I think we as Irish people can kind of reclaim, if we wish to or not. Um, sorry, right, I wanted to go to where you were inspired, Carmel, 
I don't know, did you, well, you were in contact with Manicon um, and then you approached Skibbereen Arts Festival and said, I've an idea for a project because we're going to share yeah. the screen and show a few of those images. Well, it's exactly what you were just saying, Dave. I realized, wow, this language is a portal to a way of knowing where we are, where we are right now in time and space. Um, the past isn't dead. You know, it's alive right here and now. I think um, that that illusion that the past is behind you is very unhelpful. And I don't think the Irish makes that mistake. Um, so I felt that a lot of the words, like just to ground it again in a few of the words that Moncon did bring us back, as it were, was um, count, counter and alter. The idea that every counter, every district in this realm has its twin in the invisible realm or the supernatural realm or something that's just not material. It's not visible, but it doesn't mean it's any less alive and influential in our way of being in this world. Or even that there's words like cola vrak, the entrance to the fairy realm. Like the minute you present that term cola vrak, the fact it has a name, I mean, I know there is a lot of phenomena, you know, that maybe we might say has potency because it can't be named. But the act of naming it shows that it had a communal currency hmm. that it could be shared as an experience. And I love that. You re remember, Moncon, that I asked a group of photographers to come together and image the words that Moncon had gathered specifically in 32 words. And we were really attracted to the words that were about naming invisible phenomena or phenomena that's hard to grasp, but it, it actually has real meaning and value um, to be able to speak it. Because then we can acknowledge that our lives are something other than these little kind of consuming units. <laughs> That, you know, where I, I think that's a large prompt for this revival of looking at, as Moncon mm. say, ancient languages that um, include timeless ways of um, describing our embodied experience and our maybe disembodied experience, even flying forward to before conception, after death. Like the, these languages are sophisticated mm. in talking about this and we're groping and grasping with the decline of religion for ways to speak about these things so in fact it's right here at our fingertips mm. and arguably we enlivened the english language when we became when we became english speakers because we brought our, our way of thinking and seeing the world into the english language and and uh, and, and i think we're, our literature through english is is renowned you know across the world um but I'd, I'd love if Carmel described the, so my, my project was just putting a load of words uh, in a book, you know, on white paper and black ink. And then Carmel, the bravery of her idea to get these photographers to come together and then the, actually manifest them in Skibbereen, in shop windows. Well, let's have a look. Screen. Let's have a look. I'll share the screen here now. So, um, Brain Ailsha. Brain Ailsha, Monocon, oh, I can zoom in. Oh, there are fairy droplets that fall on the tombs of tyrants causing rot. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a specific word. <laughs> and that was put on the church, right? On these oh, yes. outside the old church. In, in, in Bale on the Cobb. So the notion was to put them in places there where they'd almost be like theatrical encounters with the location. Because, you know, I mean... Fairy droplets that fall on the tombs of tyrants causing rot. In what context might that be used? Outside a church? Uh, you mean outside a church? We we'll leave that to your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the, so the, the reference is Aisha means is the modern word for cancer. But previously it meant a particularly nefarious type of fairy, a particular evil fairy. And so Bray and Aisha with some of these fairies had the ability to exude a certain liquid that would do damage to other dark forces. That's the Goodness me. OK. Uh, and thank you for sending me these, Carmel. I think you, you send them to me in, in a rush, kind of going, we must talk about this. I think you'd love it. I was like, absolutely. Oh, well, this is one of the controversial. Well, never mind. actually, you can talk about the one no, that actually this, this one didn't get one this one didn't get complained about. <laughs> no, not at all. This is these are word and blah squealer. 
Blast squealer. Menstruation, which literally means, you know, the... Bloom shedding. Bloom shedding, yeah. That's or fantastic. the blog birta, bloom spilling. And and uh, you can see the images that these um, that this term inspired. Mm. The sanitary towel in the furry handbag and the sandwich with lovely dried rose petals. And I'm looking to see what old shop you put it on. I suppose maybe a chemist might have been suited. Well, do you know what? <laughs> Actually, this was an eyesore in the centre of town. Um, you know, an old, like a, an old disused building that has called, it's just become so dilapidated um, that it was very, a very impoverished part of the town to visually. So it was largely about putting a big pop of pink, hot pink, mm. and then something that would cause a little frisson, a little excitement. And then what you saw was people as they walked along, they were very attracted to the pink, so they were drawn in. And then there would be, you'd often witness a little bounce off people and then a real giggle from people. It was now, actually, let me just inquire, you're Bally de Hob base, but was this in Skibbereen or did you do it in? Yeah, I'm sort of in between Bally de Hob and Skibbereen. I've been given out to by loads of Skibbereen people saying, why are you always saying you're from Bally de Hob? You're actually <laughs> as much from here as there. I just want yeah. to be from Bally de Hob. <laughs> yeah, it, well, 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 <laughs> you're, oh, these are hot local um, yes. be, here. Be careful, be careful. You're, you're, you've, you've, you're a blow-in from North Cork as is. Um, yeah, exactly. Bail on the cob, the mouth of the two. I think it's. I think, I'm not sure. It's cob is oh. specific. It's two rivers, is it? Or yeah, yeah. And there's two rivers going through Bally the Hob that meet then in that section under the twelve, the twelve arch. And bring you out to Roaring Water Bay or yeah. um, Carberry's Thousand Islands. Um, I'm not sure what it was. Ask Welga. Um, Skibbereen is a, a harbour for small boats. I think. A skilberine, I think, mm. is what I looked that one up as. I'm not sure. And then is that, but in Bail on the Cob, is it not the Cob, the, the Gob, your two mouths as well? So it's the mouth oh. of the two mouths of the oh. river. Oh, oi. That's, even, that's even more sort of poetic, isn't it? It's the mouth of the two mouths. And I mean, look, I haven't, a fair I few haven't, people with two mouths down there too, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I um, hadn't reflected on that image before, but to see the sort of the cross of the church, the shadow of the church that must be looming over the two oh, images is wow. really beautiful. Yeah. Goodness me. Yeah, great shot. Well spotted, Moncon. Yeah. It's direct from the other church, the um, the other church in the town. And again, so. sorry, in, in Skib. Yeah. yeah so that's just near the Skib Market that people would know. Yeah. It's just on the outside of Skib Market. Yeah. And this one, I clean, mean, clear there's... Fish. Yeah. yeah, William Bach, the photographer, is actually featured in the image itself here. And um, William, I think this is such a beautiful image. Like William would have been, if you look closely, now some people assume that the person in purple is a woman or and others clearly recognise the person to be a man. But um, he was nervous about putting this up. He wouldn't mind me saying because... You know, it's a very tender, private moment between him and his partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, it took a long time before he'd agreed to put it in a public place because he thought it would be vandalized mm -hmm. and that there would be graffiti put on it. And the word that he made the image for in particular was, or the phrase is, Kliha feast, which is a kind of wattle, a bed of wattles. That was the bed of knowledge on which druids lay to draw um, inspiration. Me. Would that be uh, right, Monpon? Or would you like to? Actually, no, that? that's right. That's it. Yeah, because that was his image for that so, phrase. And these are well selected words as well. They're very lyrical. Um, I mean, wow. um, I, I noticed a little. Well, we'll go to the next one actually, and I'll draw I it out tell there. you one thing though. Uh -huh. Nobody did. Nobody touched that image. And even the kind of casual things people do, like kids maybe pick at a loose corner and peel it off when it starts to come off. No one touched that. And it was real, it brought a lot of real tenderness into the kind of center of town around our vulnerability hmm. and showing our vulnerability in a public place. And I presume this QR code brings you to where there's information about what the project is. Yeah, was. they were vandalized, which was really <laughs> interesting because there's a theory that QR codes are part of, you know, 
Oh, uh, get, oh God. We'll go survey. Um, well, here's what you sent to me. It just occurred to, uh, I love this 32 words for books. Um, so it was ways of seeing 32 words for field, I think is what you call the project. Let's move on to another image. Uh, again, in front of the old church in Skibbereen, as we can see That's there. That phrase, Coal of Rack. The Coal of Rack. The fairy world. Wow. And that was in a wood. In fact, that was a tiny little scene that when I photographed it, it looked quite epic, like almost almost like a Lord of the Rings or type environment, but it was in a little woodland over in Ardnagashal in Ballylicky. But it went in under the church and I loved how Moncon, I remember you saying about um, the word for cathedral in Irish, essentially meaning, what's, will you explain about the, where the trees meet the canopy when you look up into the arch canopy of a, of a corpse of trees, how that's essentially a cathedral? Yeah, but I don't. I don't think the mean the word of the Irish. What's the R Douglas? There's no. But it's just as a concept. Like we know that the Celts people worshipped in a nematon, which was mm -hmm. a sacred grove of oak trees, mm -hmm. and then it just seems that we then kept that alive. That the R people and so the Celtic people who worshipped the nematon was throughout Europe. You know, the Celtic people of Europe. They, they, Julius Caesar and Pliny say they they worshipped in a nematon, a collection, a grove of oak trees. And then we just basically built that out of stone. So that's why those Gothic cathedrals in Britain or in Europe are these soaring trunks with the um, branches reaching up into the, into the rafters. It's basically a re uh, reconstruction of the forest. Well, it might be a nice moment to introduce here because, you know, that's a, so the trailblazery nudging, nudging society or nudging humanity forward uh, is, an, uh, is, a, a, has, is running its second run of, of Skull Scarcha, Hedge School, a nine week online um, Irish language culture, uh, but also part of what it's trying to do is, is sort of suggesting that through the Irish language and reconnecting with it is a new way to live in more ecological balance and reframe how we see the world. Because just in, in terms of what you're talking about, and even in terms of what I've read is, there is such a connection between, like there were sacred trees in Ireland where they were they called billas and they were in the different locations. And, um, you know, there seems, and, and again, if you go with Gael being a, a term that's suggesting people of the tree language or, or tree people, clearly trees were central to, to us as a people at one point on this island and we lost them to a huge and great degree too. And I, I, I'm certainly seeing a lot of, um, in my Twitter stream, it may well be the sorts of things that I have signed up and on to, but there is a real hunger amongst people to try to restore, um, you know, the Irish countryside to, to, to some degree or other. And, and about that part of that is bringing back a, a far greater range of native trees to the landscape. And, and perhaps that timing and this resurgence of, of, uh, of interest and, and appreciation and desire, a hunger for the Irish language are linked. So well, it'd be a, wonderful a, if, you know, our new churches were actually um, tree plantations, that we actually, that we go out into the trees together to commune um, with our deeper nature and, and with actually a sense of perspective around we're only one species on this planet. Do you know, which is lovely to remember. I think it brings great psychological peace. We've certainly, a lot had, of we've certainly had quite an arrogance as a as a sort of a I don't know what are we what are we as humans are we a race we're a species we've had an, a, a, a huge and 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 people take a religious justification from that from readings in the Bible saying I gave you the the, the beasts and and the you know I'm not sure if that's a sentiment I would share and um, that it, the the world is ours to 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 make use of as we see fit. Um, I mean, I Montan, you, you often explain around like that at least there are more vestiges that, of course, Christianity has left many prints through Irish as well. But there are so many prints of the more paganistic or the pantheist worldview um, that would have predated Christianity in Ireland. So there's there's so many opportunities for us to um, evolve a new kind of religious experience together. And that and that that experience was lost too with the language because the 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 you know people see Ireland as this you know or or at least was this you know deeply Catholic country uh, uh, under the auspices of of the Roman Church but it wasn't pre famine um, you know much of of Gaelic Ireland had quite a loose relationship the, the numbers that went to to a weekly mass that didn't mean they weren't believers or or, or didn't weren't religious or, or, or spiritual, but they certainly weren't weekly adherents doffing the cap and, you know, and whatever the church says goes. It was, 
it was quite a, a, a an open relationship, let's say. Um, that, that, that... You, yeah, you can see that from the amount of wells. How there's more worship sites of wells in Ireland. Like that was not a uniquely Irish thing. That was all over the world. But because we kept that connection with the sacredness of trees, of certain trees. This, I mean, we, both Cleophis and Cola Brack, the last two words refer to those things that go back. But this would all be marginal and alternative and limited, limited, lim, limited conversation. And it has been on, you know, on tiny fringes of society. But what's fascinating, as you say, is now it's becoming mainstream. Now the Skibbereen, the people are willing to fund and to accept a big exhibition like that. Skull Scarta, as you say, this online hedge school and it's interesting that it's a, a tree-based school a hedge school bringing basically connecting education and nature is now you know getting sold out the minute it goes on sale on, as an online and anything that seems to be the other th big thing that i noticed is pop-up welgas well you know it suffered a lot during covid basically where the organizers will contact a publican and say we'd like to have an irish language event in your pub and they'll go ah well no we don't think we'll we want to do that now because they know how these were sort of sad sack events in the past the three people turning up with a cup of tea and then the uh, organizers of pop up Gwelga say you know we're going to drop seven grand in your in your account in your pub tonight if you and they oh yeah they sign it up and it's just because what's changed is every you know do you now have mass consciousness, particularly since COVID, eager to connect with all of these things. Mm. So they've always been on the fringes and the margin. It's all been on poor Liam O'Wainley's shoulders, basically, and the few mm. public Irish language figures and Bree Dog mm. Um, But what has changed is people are connecting to land, people are connecting to culture and language, and that's what's exciting. Mm. And I, yeah, I, every person we asked um, to let us put a big billboard on the side of their building, once we referenced 32 words for field, it was an open door. Good man, man of Khan, huh? Yeah, Good job. It was, and because actually everywhere I go now, somebody mentions him, mentions Moncon. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. It is, it's the Irish dovetailing with the want for something more than being kind of um, corralled into a type of economy where you're just a little digital well, well I, I love um hang on i'm gonna stop sharing this for a minute we'll go back to it because um i love uh, spinning around and, and and going to places on, on the map and seeing what's there and whatever else and i've you know i'm, I'm familiar with a lot of the archaeological sites and the sort of um uh, i mean uh, what i would highly recommend is in our ma evan maka amen maka well, how would you pronounce that Man yeah awan maka awan maka awan maka but it's old Irish, so you're anyone you're entitled to any pronunciation. None of us are sure. Fair enough. Well, that's a good point to make, actually, is that people always fixate on what's the right way to say something, but actually there aren't really that defined rules around Irish. So um say whatever way you like <laughs> uh, to, to a degree. You'd probably be corrected, but anyway. Um, but no, I, the reason I ask is because it 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 became in English uh, Navin Fort, and you kind of try to go, how did Awan Maka become so you're you're imagining an Ulster action, uh, accent on Navan on the on Navan I was imagining anyway I I don't know but it became Navan for it in English, uh, and and probably because of cross border money and the like uh, and you know uh, they have and again I mean I was I was down in um, Ushnock in in Westmeath near near you Monacon and um, who is it your man he used to be the uh, I forget his name now it's a pity because Justin Moffat yes Justin exactly Moffat. he used to be the manager of the Blizzards. And uh, he was brilliant, but I think he wasn't. So I was saying how when you go to, um, which also, what do, we, what do people call it? Uh, Tara, but it's actually Tamar or Tamer. Mm -hmm. I don't know how, how did that end up, Tara? Uh, Tamer or, or Tamar. Um, there's, I've, the church has always been closed that has a bit of an exhibition about it. So I've never, I, so maybe they do a really great exhibition, I don't know. But you go to Awan Maka in Ardma and they have an interpretive center. There's books, there's a cafe. There's a dude came to us in full regalia from 500 or whatever period of time it was, brought us up to a, a Cranog, not a Cranog, I know that's the island, but whatever the hut might be, maybe it was made out to be a Cranog, brought us into the hut, sat us down. Now I'm a grown adult now, but if I'd been a kid, it might've been even more enjoyable, but I'm a big kid as an adult, uh, as we all are. And he'd all, the, and he brought, so he talked through his daily life, wearing the gear, talking uh, as if, he, yeah, it was fabulous. And I was like, that should be in all of these royal sites around Ireland. Mm -hmm. um, what's it? Um, uh, uh, Rath Crowan in in, yeah. in 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 Connacht, yeah. um, and people I don't even think know about these places largely. But the one I went to, thanks to your book, that I didn't even know about, I think it was is it Caramora Square or Asperla? in Sligo, or, or is no? This sorry, La sorry, Caramora. I haven't been to La in Sligo. Lochru, Lochru, exactly. La yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and and I got a beautiful day. That's actually I went down to Ushnock straight after it. 
Um, but I got a blue sky, sunshine day, 20 counties, just fabulous. And uh, I couldn't get into it to do your little no. experiments. I don't know what no. words you were saying, words into the, <laughs> to You're get gonna, the resonance. I've just spent the last year writing this new book about landscape, about all the places you've just mentioned. In fact, you could have written the exact book I've written. <laughs> it's like, there's this, what's happening in us that people are feeling the need to go to Ras Crahan, to go to Awan Macha, to go to Katawar, to go to Ishtach. There's something arising in us. And I, I can just say, it's not normal. Like, you know, I'm just back from Brittany and they weren't, they're not going mad about their language over there. There's two languages, Gallo and, and Breton. They just say, oh no, the language will die. Oh well, hard luck, it's gonna go. There's something mad happening in Ireland that there is this urge rising up. And none of us understand it logically. It makes no logical sense. You know, the logical sense was the idea we had 20 years ago, that it's not a practical language. It's no good to my children. That's the logical, rational language. Something weird is lighting in us, is lighting up in us at the moment. Something and we just, just occurred to me. I don't know, Moncon, what you might think it is, but is it because where we're at now as a society, we're definitely in the death throes of one particular way of, be, of, of, of functioning as a society. And we're in the most accelerated change that you could possibly ever be in as a human being by way of where we're headed to by way of as a digitally organized society. And is it that a language that has almost died shows you what can be lost or also what can be reborn, re resurrected, or shows you a perspective of the cycles, the whole revolution of birth, death. I do, there's no doubt that it's, it's because how you're describing what's the dividends of what's still sacred about us engaging in Irish somehow has to do with what's going on right now globally. Mm. Mm. You know, I hearing you say that, Carmel, makes me think, like, do we recognize it as a big anchor as we get blown around and buffeted by the world winds? Do we look and go, actually, there's something we can hang on to here and maybe we should. Yeah. But maybe it's more than an anchor. Maybe it's an actual, almost like a huge weather constellation, a constellation of weathers that we can see the movement rather than, because it's so massive. Like, I feel like a child at this like cliff face of learning through Irish actually and I'm very excited by that because I go like actually we don't need to hang on so much as maybe to let go to incredible learning and incredible new vistas but they're already behind us as much as, as ahead of us. Mm. That level oh. of strangeness is, a, is behind us. Yes. If we want an idea of something incredibly strange or foreign to, in a way, the ultimate foreignness for an Irish person is their own culture. Mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in some funny way. Yeah, there are, it's, 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 yes, there's, there's lots of bizarre aspects about um, us and our history, but it is for us to, to reclaim what we're, what we're comfortable with. Let me go back to just a few more of these. Um, uh, I, I think I have a couple more that you sent to me. Sklimpini. Uh, Natural lights that dance oh. before your eyes. Oh. oh, I do remember this, I think, from the book. Yeah. So I mean, ima imagine if we taught Irish in this way, like the last three words we had, but one is clear is. Now, everybody, you know, which was the wattles of knowledge that you get your knowledge by sleeping on. Everyone in Ireland knows the word clear because it's by law clear. By law, you know, the by the town of the fort of the wattles. So we know that they were hazel wattles and our hazel sticks, basically. And it just happens that we have, from the last 3,000 years, considered the hazel the magic bush, a bush that could actually, if you slept on top of it, it the magic would go into you. So if we were telling kids that, or if we were telling kids, again, as Carmen said, coal of rack, a coal of rack means a threshold into the other world. You can imagine there's no kid at the age of five if that's how they're being introduced to the language is not going to get a very excited. And again, it's both practical because cola just means an entrance or a door. And then brack means speckled or something magical connected to it. So which, yeah. which is where we get brack from in, for our Halloween. Exactly. Uh, for those exactly. who recall. And, that's right. and that's a lot of what you're doing in this book here, too. I mean, Madra Cran, we'll just use the one example, mm -hmm. uh, a squirrel as a tree dog. And, and the, the words and the descriptions and the way uh, Irish language describes things is 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 a lot more is is far looser, is far more romantic, far more poetic, and far more lyrical. And again, for me, relates to how maybe when we moved into that English language, we enlivened it uh, to a great degree. Um, 
Actually, we had another project on tree dogs, um, Dave, mm -hmm. where we got kids drawing pictures, not taking photographs, but drawing pictures in response to the words. And we had kids from mainly Cork, but also international kids. And their appetite for the Irish was, was actually extraordinary based on the magic. Well, Again, do you remember, so it's what you were talking about doing No Bear Live Monocon made me think of, uh, do you remember the film You Ming is Adam Dumb? Yeah. <laughs> what an irony. Uh, yeah. So for anyone who doesn't know, I don't think I ever saw it. I, I, I saw a clip of it and I certainly know the conceit of it. Uh, a Chinese guy wants to come visit Ireland so he learns Irish and lands yeah. in Ireland and can't communicate with anyone. <laughs> <laughs> they keep on telling him wherever he arrives in Dublin Airport and then elsewhere they just go, oh, go to Connemara, go to Connemara and finally go <laughs> the last season. Um, Turer, Turera. Yeah. Turera. 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 There you go. You can actually say it as if you've got a stammer. Turera. Turera. Someone who eats food without condiment, a humorless person. Ah, he's only a Turera. Well, everybody knows Turera. Yes, that's true. It's so specific. And as you said, the word, the photo you had just up in advance, that one there, like that's a powerful image. The you know the last one, not Turera, but the oh, oh, this one. Tumma. 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 Well, there, yeah, I wanted to leave that last because I know Carmel has a, you know, a, a comment she wants to make on this in terms of this was the only one that really attracted negative uh, bite back. And this is preparing a corpse for waking totally exhausted. Tonica. Maybe not negative because, you know, it just was it was taken down. And interesting, the tenor of the conversation, you know, when I tried to just have the conversation around why it was taken down. Uh, one of the statements, for instance, was we've enough debt. I, we don't want debt anywhere near us. You know, and um, I and understand. Should we say what means, should we, Carmel? So, you know, yeah. means, in case you didn't see it, it means the, the washing of a corpse and the preparing of a corpse um, for, for death. Yeah. So, Tunachum means I wash and prepare a corpse for laying out in, in the north. Mm. Now, there was a mixed response really to that image. In fact, I saw some people in a more almost like an attitude of prayer in front of it. Um, and I recognize people who've lost people quite recently in that attitude. But I suppose it's where we place things. In fairness, I think it's a reasonable request to say it. Mm, okay, we take it down. I, I quite respect these things, but I want to investigate them. Mm. And I, I, um, I, my sense is that once, when that was taken out of that window and put into an art gallery, it was perfectly acceptable mm. because a gallery is almost like a church so, or a funeral home. So maybe well, just like, the placement. Yeah. But then again, you learn something from, you know, if the placement was off, there was a learning from it and, and good. I, I was starting to think, even as, as I said negative, I really just wanted to get your thoughts on it because I know you mailed me about that one at the time. Yeah, Maybe it had just occurred. Um, it, it had just occurred, but you know what I'm getting at is that um, I wouldn't even see it as a negative or even a misplacement. It's more that like, it's great to be having the conversation yes. with people like yes. about it. Like, and that's what, so arts, it, that's it, what, it, that's it, what art's there to do, I guess. And especially, and the, like the language is like, you know what I mean? It's there in the language if you're citing yourself as exhausted. But then again, I love what I love what comes up in that word, the notion that we did know how to lay out bodies, that it wasn't given to the non, an undertaker to do. I just started thinking, though, as I was saying it to you, that maybe it was less negative. Maybe maybe there's still a sacredness around death that, that it was like, you know, I'm not sure you publicly display that uh, but, or, or but in, a way, in a way, Dave, what's happened is it's been professionalized. Hmm. You know, like, because even with Halloween, Halloween, sound games were all a rehearsal so that you'd always mm. know what to do when someone died. Mm. You'd know with the funeral, how to play the funeral games. Mm. And, um, you know, the mid, uh, traditionally a midwife would um, keep some of the birth water mm -hmm. and she would wash a dead body with it. Wow. Or she'd brush off little bits of the flaky skin from a dead body and she'd sprinkle a newborn baby with it. Wow. So what I'm getting at is we were part of a wheel of life yes. death, yes. life death. So we weren't so afraid of death. Mm. If you're at a funeral and you're playing raucous games, mm. 
Now, we all know still to this day, usually funerals are way better cracked than weddings. <laughs> For the most part in Ireland, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, um, yeah, I mean, you... And in Irish, you know, Moncona, like, I mean, everybody... Shlina Fearna calling death the way of truth. Mm-hmm. It's suggesting there's a great journey all together, you know, ahead of us, rather than an end point. Well, that might be a, a, a nice point to end this uh, lengthy conversation that I'm very grateful to both of you for. Um, I don't I don't know if we had a specific point we were getting to. I think it was just about this adding oxygen to this general thing uh, and, and then throwing it out for those who wish to watch this far. Um, to see what they make of it and perhaps if they've not if they're not familiar with you already Mon Khan or you Carmel they can seek out some of your works and we'll see what comes and look forward to what comes next uh, from both of you as well uh Gur you're getting on to be tentative. You've got fluent Irish. I don't know. I wish I did. No, look, 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 I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm in the game as well, though. I'm in the game. But I really, I would, I would have been interested to do the skull scar chip, but I just couldn't do that Thursday thing. But I, I, I would, would, it, would I have been able to learn the language through it, or was it a bit more than that? Yeah, you, you not. I mean, it's hard over nine weeks online to learn. You'd, you'd really be in, the whole idea is, I suppose, to inspire people to go off and learn it, but to have every day that you should be coming away with some more vocab and a better understanding of the grammar. But really, as you know, it still requires a bit of hard work. But how do you find that book you're doing now? Like what everybody is asking is, how do we learn Irish? And they ask mm. me and I never mm. quite know, is our main mm. book is every course? Mm. Um, well, funnily enough, you know, people go on about the grammar being the stumbling block for Irish, but it's as I come across the grammar, I'm interested to know why. And I, so that kind of, I, I wish I, I wish I'd someone to turn and go, but why is that? And why? So that'll come, I know, in it. But um, look, it's a it's it's a beginning. A couple of things I maybe just wanted to say, because we talked about um, the Gael talked. Um, I remember once thinking that, you know, again, and probably for a lot of young Irish people, sometimes it is their first foreign experience where they realize what a language is. And, and sometimes I'm like sending kids the Gael talk obviously is a great thing, but maybe send them in a, an Irish language speaking group somewhere else and, and get them to understand that this is actually what marks us out elsewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, are you American? Are you English? Are you whatever? Or, you know, we're not like the Canadians now where we have to say we're from Canada anytime we meet. I'm from, how do you know someone's from Canada? Because they tell you within seconds. <laughs> I'm not American is essentially what they're saying. Um, and, 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 you know, for us as well, you know, when we get mistaken for, for being English elsewhere and we're like, no, no, no. Um, but I think sometimes when you're abroad, you kind of realize actually that is the thing that, is unique to us. Um, um, and the one other thing I was going to say, that idea of a Gweltacht, you know, where we talk, there's a place where you go and they speak Irish. The island is a Gweltacht. <laughs> the whole thing. We maybe need to less compartmentalise it. You know, um, um, so it's not like, you know, you speak Irish when you go to mm-hmm. Ballyvourney or when you go to uh, Connemara or Ranafast or, or any of these places. You can speak Irish anywhere, lads. <laughs> Exactly. The Irish could, the, the whole island could be a Gweltacht and it looks like the signs that peop, more people are moving in that direction. Clearly, yeah. what yeah. we've been talking about today, it's, you know, it's still small seeds, but there's more seeds and more buds that have been visible in decades. Yes. So it's so definitely an exciting time. And we've just, I suppose, thrown out some suggestions of things, how it can yes. grow further. Yes. And what build but if you go. could make the Thursday night, Dave, you actually get the whole session the next day. So you've all week, any time to attend Skull Skarta in the following. Online. As in it's and recorded and you get the, the... For an average person who has school Irish, you'd be amazed how much... The first night I went to Skull Skarta, I was inside in bed and I couldn't sleep with the return of the Irish. Mm. Flooding it back. Was coming, like the floodgates get opened and I'm always fascinated. But where is the Irish while you can't remember it? Mm. Where does it live? Mm. <laughs> Oh, I know. Look, we need to wrap this up. Can I tell you one final thing? When we did know Berna, we, in 2007, we moved, moved, there was a famous media hypnotist at the time, Paul Golden or something was his name, he died yeah. since. But we went to him and he hypnotised people for us who hadn't spoken a word of Irish for 30 years and it came back. Now that's, that's no revelation because everyone knows how in the pub it comes back. Yeah. doing. <laughs> But they're going to it's still within us and anything could you Dave you start this conversation with pressing the button actually the button is still there and we're now beginning to find it hi very nice thanks so much guys slan slan